Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's episode of Becoming Multiplanetary. I'm one of your co-hosts, Rich LB, and with me today is Kage. Hey folks, I'm Kage, also one of the co-hosts of Becoming Multiplanetary. Thanks for joining us. And today, we will be continuing our Humans in Space mega-series. If you'd like to join us as we record these episodes, make sure to join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash totalspace, where you can then join our exclusive Discord and listen to us record in Becoming Multiplanetary, or our other shows, Deep Dive with Miko, The Space Update with Ryan, Space Shorts with Adele and other hosts, and the new upcoming series, STEM Study with Astro Rhodey. So now, let's get into today's episode and a bit more about this mega series. So, this is the sixth part of our seven part epic collaboration uh, between Total Spaces Becoming Multiplanetary with Rich LB and myself, Kage, and To the Future with Jiswan and Sebastian. In this series, titled Humans in Space, Total Space and To the Future are exploring the past present and future of humanity reaching for the stars to ultimately become a multiplanetary species with every other episode on one channel or the other. You can find all the episodes in a playlist we've put together, which is linked in the description below. The series started with To the Future reviewing the pioneers, the first humans in space and the often perilous journey to get there. Vostok, Soyuz, Mercury, Gemini, literally strapping people to modified intercontinental ballistic missiles in an attempt to reach orbit. Then we jumped in with the Travelers, the race to the moon. Lunex, the Soviet crewed lunar programs, Sea Dragon, AKA the Big Chungus rocket, and finally Apollo, placing humanity's first footprints on another planetary body. To the Future then took us through surviving in space, exploring the age of the space stations, Skylab, Salyut, Mir, Tiangong, and finally the International Space Station, where humans learned how to live and cope for long durations with the effects of microgravity. Next was us again with the current generation. We explored the past decade or so with the space shuttle program, Soyuz, and the buildup of NASA's commercial crew program. We also explored where we are today and where we're headed within the next decade with Crew Dragon, Starship, Starliner, SLS, and the Orion Capsule, and many other exciting programs expected to happen within the next 10 years. Then To the Future resumed with Mars Colony 1, a glimpse of what the future would most likely look like as humanity heads for Mars. Sebastian walked us through both the risks and the rewards of not only sending a fleet of starships, but what it would really take for us to survive there long term, including using the Martian regolith to shield our frail bodies from the unforgiving effects of solar and cosmic radiation, and how we can perform in situ resource utilization to give uh, the first brave men and women on Mars the best chance for success. which sets us up nicely for today's episode, Inhabiting Our Solar System. Today, we'll talk to you about the distant future where humanity will have no choice but to find ways to survive on other planetary bodies and why. So let's begin with why. Why Ganymede and Titan? Or even, why spread humanity across the solar system in the first place? Sebastian from To The Future did a great breakdown about this in their last episode, so we'll only briefly go over some of the reasons. First, on the plus side, space exploration yields so much technological advancement, which we never even knew we always needed. Take a moment to imagine a world without any of the benefits that came from space exploration. There would be no scratch-resistant lenses for glasses, We wouldn't have memory foam mattresses to cuddle us gently into a comfortable sleep at night. Baby formula and freeze-dried food might not exist. The SLR cameras, camera phones, webcams, and more wouldn't exist either. Can you imagine not being able to buy the latest Android or iPhone and take a picture of life around you? Or wireless headphones and other similar forms of wireless technology. Even mobile computing like laptops and tablets. Those are thanks to developments in space technology. 
there would probably be no LEDs, meaning no fancy RGB in computer cases, no flat screen monitors and TVs, no energy saving bulbs, and a whole lot more. Athletic shoes probably wouldn't exist as we know them today, nor would modern forms of landmine removal. Yeah, really. Dust busters might also not exist, so being able to keep parts of your home tidy without using those awful handheld dusters would be much more difficult. Homes would most likely still be insulated with wads of old newspaper rather than today's modernized aluminized polyesters. Firefighters wouldn't have the jaws of life to perform life-saving extraction procedures. Cat scans and other forms of radiography might not even exist. Foil blankets, which are often used to save people suffering from hypothermia, wouldn't exist. Water purification systems, which have saved countless lives to provide potable drinking water, might not exist as we know them now. We probably wouldn't have ear thermometers, uh, the infrared ones which have been crucial for the medical industry, especially lately during this pandemic, or a big one, GPS. Imagine not having the system that yells at you to turn left now and needing to rely once again on huge fold-out maps. The list goes on and on and on. But those are just the technological advancements. There are other, let's call them, less optimistic reasons for humans to become a multiplanetary species. The usual reasons are there. Having a backup plan for humanity in the event of an asteroid impact or a massive solar coronal mass ejection that strips away much of the atmosphere. But these are pretty well known by now. The reason that doesn't get talked about that much is also one that far, far too many people willfully refuse to acknowledge is even real. Human caused climate change. Now, let's be uncomfortably honest for a moment. Not only is human caused climate change absolutely real, but we're far past too many points of return at this point. Even if all carbon and methane emissions worldwide were completely stopped all at once, it still wouldn't be enough. Within this century alone, unthinkable effects will continue to occur as a result. Indeed, they already are. Winters are getting colder, summers are getting hotter, floods, droughts, and wildfires are all getting worse, and potable water is quickly becoming a scarce resource. There are many attempts to combat this and to try and make us carbon negative. The Paris Accords, for example, Elon Musk's 100 million US dollar X Prize for carbon removal, and many more. But if recent history and politics have shown anything, it's that these simply will not be anywhere near enough. The Fermi paradox speaks of a great filter as a possible cause for never being contacted by other intelligent species, and human-caused climate change may indeed become our own great filter. If humanity does not find a way to survive off Earth and not be dependent on her resources, the human race as we know it could very well end. This is the uncomfortable dark truth of humanity becoming multiplanetary. In order for our species to survive, we must find a viable alternative to this planet we call home. The moon and Mars are great stepping stones, but they will not be the panacea to this problem. We require resources for survival that simply cannot be found or manufactured from either of these two planetary bodies. They provide a great means to practice, learn, and adapt, but humanity must reach further. Whereas the moon and Mars are sprints, what we really need is a way to win the marathon. Places like Ganymede and Titan present serious opportunities to give us the ability to win that marathon. The in-situ resource utilization opportunities on those two moons alone create so many possibilities for humanity to survive and thrive in our solar system without the need to rely on Earth's resources nearly as much. And space agencies like NASA and the European Space Agency, ESA, are already well aware of this. Back in 2004, the Huygens probe, named after Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens, who discovered Titan in 1655, landed on the surface of Titan on January 14, 2005. During its parachute descent and landing, Huygens took several photographs and performed spectral radiometric readings of the atmosphere and surface. But that wasn't all. 
Huygens even had an onboard microphone and recorded its descent through the atmosphere. Listen to what the atmospheric entry of Saturn's moons sounded like. These measurements provided an enormous amount of data. So much so that NASA has decided to return to the icy surface of Saturn's moon. In 2019, NASA announced its next mission to Titan, the Dragonfly Rotocraft. Scheduled to launch in 2026 and land on Titan in 2034, the Dragonfly Rotocraft will slowly descend via parachute and then fly the rest of the way down to the surface using its octocopter blades to chop through Titan's atmosphere that's four times as dense as here on Earth. This would make it the second drone ever to fly on another planetary body, the first of course being the Ingenuity uh, uh, helicopter on Mars that just occurred in the past few weeks. For the next 2.7 years, if not more, Dragonfly will then fly around ferrying its entire scientific payload from site to site to explore and measure organic dunes, impact freighters, prebiotic chemistry, and subsurface oceans. This will give us the first real glimpse not only into the possibility of life having existed on Titan, but also to find the potential of what kind of resources could be utilized from Saturn's moon somewhere down the line. This all sounds very exciting, but reaching Ganymede and Titan and extracting their precious resources, especially with humans as part of that equation, certainly will not come easy and present several major challenges. We've broken these down into four major categorical risks and how we can overcome them. The first major risk is the ability to fast travel. Think about it for a minute. If you were standing on one end of a hallway and your loved one was on the other end, but between you is a fire, you wouldn't leisurely stroll through the fire, you would look to clear past the flames as quickly as humanly possible. Morbid analogies aside, the same principle can be applied to traveling through cosmic radiation. By traveling to your destination quickly, you can reduce your exposure time to damaging radiation and the effects of zero gravity on the body, therefore mitigating exposure and atrophy through the control of a temporal factor via an increase in velocity. Run fast through the fire. Great. Now, how do we do that though? One of the options that we could look at is nuclear thermal propulsion, or simply NTP for short. Many content creators have already made really good videos on what exactly NTP is already, and we'll link to one from Amy Shearer title in the description. So, whilst we won't go too much into detail here, we will take a couple of key points away from this. NTP is not a new concept. We already had designed and built nuclear-powered rockets in the past with the NERVA program back in the late 1960s and early 1970s. NERVA, short for Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Application, was essentially an exposed nuclear reactor core that could use a fraction of the fuel of a classical chemical engine Nerva rockets are in many ways very similar to chemical engines, consisting of turbo pumps, a combustion chamber, throat and nozzle, and engine bell. Where they differ was that they used a monopropellant without any oxidizer, instead using uranium-235 in a fissile state with beryllium controls, where liquid hydrogen was pumped through and superheated to create immense amounts of thrust for very long durations. At its peak, the NERVA program was able to achieve incredible records. 90 minutes of burn time, 4,500 megawatts of thermal power, 250,000 pounds of thrust, which isn't a lot compared to chemical engines, but where they really stood out was that they had 850 seconds of specific impulse, twice that of any chemical rocket engine to date, and at a thrust to weight ratio of three to four. Now. What exactly does this mean? Well, in essence, it means if you burn a traditional chemical rocket next to an NTP rocket, the latter, with the same amount of propellant as the traditional chemical rocket, 
would burn for exactly twice as long before running out. This then translates into extra time for thrust, which turns into faster travel times. The longer you can burn your engines, the faster you can go. There were plans in the late 1960s to fit a Nerva engine to the third stage of the Saturn V to achieve a journey to Mars in as little as three months. And to reach Saturn and Titan? Only three years, as opposed to seven years or longer with a typical chemical engine. The second major risk is power. As we go further out into the solar system, we lose more and more solar energy the further away we get from the sun. A study carried out by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA in 2007 attempted to increase the efficiency of photovoltaic panels so they would be able to operate at up to 10 astronomical units, or roughly 10 times the distance of Earth from the sun, which puts us just beyond Saturn. Titan itself is about 9.5 astronomical units away from the Sun, just on the very edge of what the JPL study said was possible. And at that distance, it only receives about 1% of the solar energy that we receive here on Earth. But even with this study and advancements in the field of photovoltaics and nanomaterials, the fundamental operation of the technology becomes much harder to sustain the further out from our mother star you get. To put this into perspective, the four giant solar arrays on the International Space Station only generate anywhere between 84 to 120 kilowatts of power, enough to power an average of 40 homes, and that's only at one astronomical unit away. It took multiple space shuttle missions to bring those into orbit, and they're still nowhere close to the hundreds of kilowatts, perhaps megawatts, that it would uh, likely be needed to survive so far away from Earth. Why megawatts, you may ask? Well, good question. Consider that the average surface temperature of Titan is a balmy negative 182 degrees Celsius or negative 296 degrees Fahrenheit. Titan also has a somewhat thick atmosphere of mostly methane, so that will further sap uh, thermal energy from the exterior of any ship on its surface. It will take a considerable amount of energy to ensure that all mechanical equipment, electronics, and especially humans are kept warm. Additionally, on the surface of Titan at these temperatures, the ice is so thick and dense, it's almost like bedrock, which means a lot more energy will be needed for drilling and uh, liquid water extraction equipment, then there are the processing facilities for that water, for energy, fuel, food production, the list goes on. All this quickly adds up to likely being in the megawatt range, which is generally in the range of what nuclear power plants here on Earth generate. Solar panels just won't work here. So what are the alternatives? This is where nuclear electric systems would come in. Nuclear electric generators are nothing new in space. Viking 1 and 2, the Mars Lander, Pioneer 10 and 11, the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo, Cassini, Ulysses, New Horizons, even the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers all use radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTG for short. RTGs use arrays of thermocouples and semiconductive materials to convert the heat released by the decay of radioactive material into electricity using something called the Seebeck effect, named after the Baltic German physicist Thomas Johann Seebeck, who independently rediscovered it in 1821, although it was first discovered by Italian scientist Alessandro Volta in 1794. RTGs bring a lot of benefits, the first of which being that it can be fueled using byproducts of a nuclear thermal propulsion engine, for example, extracting strontium-90 from the fissile product yield of uranium-235 used in an NTP engine. Other benefits of RTGs are that they are rather small and lightweight while yielding a fairly decent amount of power for quite a long time relative to their size. For example, the RTG on the Perseverance rover is 64 by 66 centimeters, or 25 by 26 inches, weighs 45 kilograms, or 99 pounds, and yields about 110 watts at its peak, which will slowly degrade over the course of about a decade, as shown by the Curiosity rover, which shares the same power system. But that last part is also a major problem. Only 110 watts for something about the size of a mini fridge. 
this is about four orders of magnitude smaller in power delivery than what a Titan outpost would likely need. If the power output of an RTG scales linearly with its size, then that means we would need an RTG that's about 42 square kilometers in size. Nice number, by the way. Instead, what Titan or Ganymede uh, outposts may need is a full-scale nuclear power plant like what we'd find here on Earth. Perhaps even a molten salt reactor. But I digress. Maybe an RTG isn't what would work well for primary power sources on Titan or Ganymede, but it could have another important application, that being ion thrusters. Ion thrusters are already actively being used on technology today, like the Starlink constellation for station keeping uh, thrust. By using an RTG to create electricity, you can then use said electricity to power this drive and create small amounts of thrust, but thrust that lasts for a very, very long time. Using this nuclear approach will allow us to not have to rely on our parent star, and that is what will unlock the doors for us to reach the outer edges of our solar system and beyond. Uranus, Neptune, and beyond that, well, we'll let Jishuan and Sebastian tell you all about that in their next episode in this series. The third major risk is consumable resource management. As we go out into our solar system and try to make new civilizations and new worlds, we then have the dilemma of how do we sustain ourselves with food, with fuel, with minerals, and, and more. If we are one of the first humans to land on Ganymede or Titan, we cannot realistically nor sustainably rely on Earth for all our resources that we need on a long-term arrangement. However, the beauty of Titan and Ganymede is that they have several sibling moons which can be also be harvested for very little Delta V usage. This brings us neatly to ISRU, or In-Situ Resource Utilization. Once we get to these destinations, ideally we would have sent probes to analyze the average composition of the rocks and soil in order to determine potential concentrations of natural resources which can be used in the production of a Frontier Pathfinder outpost. On Titan, there are several naturally occurring resources both within the atmosphere and also in the form of various ice deposits. Lakes and seas of methane and ethane hydrocarbons also exist on the surface of Titan, and even clouds have been spotted in the atmosphere too, which shows that Titan also has its own active hydrological system. The kicker being that this entire system is based on hydrocarbons. So, what can we do here? We already have methods for extracting hydrocarbons from a liquid medium through the process of fractional distillation, giving us a foundation to work from. Ice mining will most assuredly be a commonplace industry by this time, and can also provide basic resources that can be transported between outposts. The ice can also be used to create breathable oxygen and potable water, which would help sustain the first outpost pathfinders, paving the way for the rest to follow. Lastly, one resource that Titan can provide in spades is that of scientific research. By sending scientists to Titan, we would gain really deep insights into its hydrocarbon rain cycle and also biotic chemistry unique to this place, not to mention the scientific and technological discoveries that could stem from such research. Ganymede would also mostly have the same major trades and industries as Titan would. However, Ganymede does not have the naturally occurring hydrological system that Titan does due to its comparable lack of atmosphere. So, let's take a quick look at what we have on Ganymede. The comp composition of the surface of Ganymede is roughly equal parts silicate rock and water. With a silicate rock, if we can extract silica from it, we can make silicone, and in turn, microprocessors. Also, windows. N no, not the operating system, we means the ones you can look through in your home. If you also include methods of refinement along with some other substances, we can make artificial silicate compounds such as Portland cement, ceramics, and water glass. As for the water, this would most likely be in the form of water ice, which could also be mined similarly to Titan's methods and would also become a major trade and export industry. So as we can see, in-situ resource utilization on both outposts would be required in order to sustain us out in the outer planets of the solar system, and from this, a booming trade industry would be born with ice haulers and asteroid miners or rock hoppers 
not too dissimilar from the Belta Lauda Baratna of The Expanse. Speaking of the Beltas, this brings us neatly to our last challenge, and that is the long-term effects of human bodies in zero-g or micro-g environments. This fourth and final major risk is also the most difficult one to overcome when it comes to humans in space. As humanity sets out into space, we need to confront one harsh, cold truth. Humanity did not come designed out of the box to survive in space. The only way that we can really travel through it is to encapsulate ourselves in a box which contains a piece of the conditions that we live in. If that bubble bursts in any way, well, that's it. Space is one extremely hostile environment for humanity, and if we are to venture into it, we must be both prepared to stay in it for extended periods of time and also try to anticipate as many challenges as possible and meet them all head on and find ways and means to be able to overcome them. The first challenge will be space motion sickness or SMS, like the text message. This is all just as it sounds, a type of motion sickness which happens in space with nearly half of all astronauts who have gone to space so far being susceptible to this. SMS can cause severe nausea, projectile vomiting, fatigue, malaise, and headaches. So far, for SMS, the most common method used to deal with it at the moment is through the use of promethazine, which is an injectable antihistamine which has anti-emetic properties. The only downside is that it can cause a bit of drowsiness. Next, we have musculoskeletal challenges that arrive from long-term micro-G exposure. Bone resorption, decreased bone mineral density, and muscular atrophy are all prevalent within long periods of microgravity. To combat these at the moment, we have resistance bands and a specialized exercise machine in the International Space Station, which the astronauts must train on daily in order to reduce the effects of these challenges, but it does not mitigate them altogether. In the near future, we may also see pharmacological and or nutritional interventions in the form of amino acids or beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonists to increase muscle mass in combination with current resistive exercises already in use as an additive measure to combat muscular atrophy. As for bone resorption, there may be some promise in whole body vibration as a technique to slow the process, though this is still in the early stages of being tested. With cross-disciplinary research carried out on this between nutritionists, doctors, pharmacologists, and fitness experts, we should eventually see a tried and true combination regime of pharmacological, physical, and nutritional interventions which will see us no longer be affected by these issues. Now, if you plan on spending any amount of time in space, and especially if you plan on cruising outside of the Van Allen belts, you are going to be exposed to radiation at much higher levels than you would here on the surface of the Earth, as most of the natural defenses like the magnetosphere and the ozone in the atmosphere are not present. Radiation is all about time, distance, and shielding. Reduce the amount of time you are exposed as much as you can, keep yourself as far away from the source as possible, and shield yourself from that which you cannot avoid. We touched earlier on how we can use an alternative propulsion method to speed up travel times to reduce our exposure time. In terms of keeping yourself as far away as possible from the source of radiation, well that's a little bit more difficult to do when you're kind of surrounded by it everywhere. So this brings us neatly to shielding ourselves from that which we cannot avoid. One of the best insulators from cosmic radiation is actually water. By having a layer of water in your spacecraft's hull, first of all, any alpha particles won't penetrate your skin, but secondly, beta particles would be stopped in their tracks entirely, gamma radiation gets diffused, and also water even has the potential to diffuse charged particles. A more futuristic approach has already been proposed in a white paper where you might be able to generate a self-contained magnetic field on a ship. We'll provide a link to the paper in the description. Essentially, it explains how you could take large superconducting coils to produce the field, though it might require a superstructure around the ship to keep the coils far enough away from the crew of the ship. 
The risks are many, but there are practical and feasible ways in which we can mitigate them without a terrible amount of effort or cost. Although many of these require simply throwing a lot of mass at the problem, which is indeed a challenge, but not one that cannot be overcome, especially as larger and larger ships are being developed that can carry over 100 tons or more to orbit. But enough about the risks. Now, come along with us on a journey to the future, oh yeah puns, where we will now explore what humanity in a multiplanetary form may just look like. The year is 2269. Humanity is now a multiplanetary species, living in permanent bases and space stations, orbiting and inhabiting the Moon, Mars, and beyond. While this sounds like a utopia, it was a horrifying journey to get here, bringing humanity to the brink of extinction in the process. In the mid-21st century, the effects of human-caused climate change could no longer be ignored or denied by the willfully ignorant. The 40% of the human population of Earth that lived within 100 kilometers of coastal regions became displaced as ocean levels rose and extreme natural disasters reshaped huge portions of Mother Earth. After coming so close to extinction, the human race finally united on a global scale to take action in a desperate attempt to save itself. Governments united and began investing huge sums of money into ensuring humanity could survive even if the Earth it knew for 10,000 years could no longer sustain it. Here we find a passenger ready to take a long journey to meet their family in the outer reaches of the solar system. Let's call her Sarah. Boarding a massive ship that bears the faintest resemblance of SpaceX starships from two centuries ago, Sarah blasts off in one of the 420 or so flights per day that bring people from Earth to space and back. Orbiting the Earth, Sarah sees the first hallmarks of humans living permanently off Earth. Dozens of enormous space stations, giant rotating tubes creating an artificial gravity effect through centrifugal force that provide the first pit stop on her journey off-world and into the deepest reaches of our solar system. After docking with one of the stations and collecting her luggage, she makes her way to her next ship. From here, the next stop is another equally massive space station orbiting the moon. From its orbit, she can see the self-governing and mostly self-sustaining lunar cities first established in the late 21st century, still requiring resources from the Earth it orbits, but providing rich deposits of minerals, manufacturing materials, and fuel for the next leg of her journey. Sarah makes her way to the next ship, a taxi vessel that would rapidly accelerate to one of the many Aldrin Cycler Castle ships running constant loops from Earth to Mars and back, themselves powered by nuclear thermal propulsion engines to ferry passengers at incredible speeds. Like the space stations orbiting Earth and the Moon, the Cyclers are giant spinning tubes to provide a modest amount of centrifugal gravity for the journey and are surrounded by liquid water to shield passengers from radiation along the way. During the journey, Sarah enjoys some of the many amenities offered, much like the Gateway Foundation hotels from a couple of centuries before. A luxury pool, entertainment halls, deeply immersive full-body virtual reality, and much more. She meets her first Homo Stella she's ever encountered, a new species of human that has evolved to survive in space. She's never met one before. After all, they cannot survive the crushing gravity on Earth. His name is Joachim, a crew member of Aldrin 7, born on the ship, and one of the several co-op donors of the vessel, inherited through his family's stay on board. He's a kind man, very tall and slender, with long arms and legs, and shows her around the ship. They promise to stay in touch via email, the interstellar replacement to email from two centuries ago. The journey is long, but not too long. Only a little over three months to reach Mars. Sarah once again boards a taxi vessel that departs from the cycler and rapidly decelerates its velocity to enter into a Martian orbit 
before finally docking with one of the many massive space stations in orbit around Mars. From here, the layover takes a while, as the next Deep Space Aldrin Cycler Castle ship won't be within range for another couple of months. Sarah decides to explore the Martian nation below, a place she's never visited yet but heard much about. Also self-governing and almost completely self-sustaining, save for some trade with Earth, the Martian nation was founded in the early 22nd century and covers half of the planet, or rather, resides just under the surface with bits of it poking out here and there. Life here is similar, but also quite different from on Earth. The people are friendly and show her around. She visits the museum that houses the rovers that Earth sent in the 20th and 21st centuries. After two months, Sarah returns to one of the space stations to take another taxi vessel to the next Aldrin Cycler Castle this one embarking on a long journey to Saturn and its moon Titan, where her mother has been working for the past seven years. This journey is a tough one, over two and a half years long, but like Aldrin 7, this cycler castle has amazing amenities, but also requires all passengers to work part-time on board to keep the ship in optimal condition. She picks up a job teaching the 23rd century evolution of English to non-native speakers, she also decides to finish her degree during her journey, studying at the university on board and writing her thesis in astrophysics. Finally, after two and a half years, Sarah arrives within range of Saturn. Peering out the window, she can see the gargantuan planet coming into view. The beauty of the gas giant is outstanding, and she takes a picture on her iPhone 673. Boarding the last taxi vessel of her journey, she sets off for the deceleration and docking with a space station in orbit around Titan, a midway point for passengers and resources mined from the icy moon. From here, she eagerly boards one more ship that takes her to the surface of Titan to meet up with her mother, an astrobiologist studying the recently discovered fish-like and microbial life found deep under Titan's surface ice. It is here that Sarah finally sees her mother again, after now almost 10 long years, hugging her so tight it hurts. The Titan outpost is huge, established in the mid 22nd century and quickly expanded when life was discovered. Over dinner, Sarah talks with her mother about what she wants to do in life. It is a difficult discussion that brings some tears and lots of emotions. The generational ship is finally ready to take off for Proxima Centauri and Sarah wants to go. She knows that means she'll never see her family again. But she is filled with pride as she talks about starting humanity's journey on a multi-century trip that will make humankind not only multiplanetary, but interstellar. And while this story could go on, it is here that we will close this chapter and hand the baton over one final time to Dishwan and Sebastian to take us to the future and tell us the next and final chapter in this journey of humans in space. The journey to becoming multiplanetary is long, and it is difficult. It comes with many risks, but it carries huge rewards for the future of humanity. We still have a long way to go to get there, but we are already making great progress to reach for the stars. With humans soon returning to the moon within this decade and expected to land on Mars within the next 10 or 20 years, this cadence will make our species a multi-planetary one within a generation or two. Not long from now, we will soon see the existence of humans permanently living far beyond the reach of our home planet and perhaps even evolving into a new species within or even beyond our solar system. Where we go from there, well, we'll leave that one for Jishwan and Sebastian to tell us about in the next and final episode of this Human in Space mega series on their channel, To the Future. Before we close this episode, we want to give a huge shout out to a few people who really helped make this possible. First, are Jishwan and Sebastian from To the Future. This has been an epic collaboration between our two channels, and we really deeply appreciate the opportunity to work together with them to make this possible. 
We tried very hard to match the quality of video editing and storytelling they do so well, and it really pushed us to learn and improve. Next is Astro Rhodey, host of the upcoming STEM study show here on the Total Space Network, who helped us a lot, <laughs> helped us really a lot with editing and putting together B-roll for this, and prior episodes of the Humans in Space series, actually. And last, but certainly not least, we want to give a big thank you to Framrick, a nuclear engineer and one of our Patreon supporters who gave us a lot of valuable information and insights for today's episode. Thank you all so very much. Speaking of Patreon, if you like what you saw today and want to help support us in bringing you this content and more, consider becoming a Patreon yourself at patreon.com forward slash total space. It really helps us out with producing content, getting better cameras, microphones, software licenses, and much more. And as always, at the end of every episode, we like to thank our Patreons. And those are Angry Astronaut, Ariel Moisa, Anthony Mann, Framrick, Gio Pagliari, Howard Walker, Dishwan and Sebastian, Marco Marouch, Michael Mars, Ryan McDonald, Sammy Oscuro, Susie R, Warhawk, and What About It? So, that about wraps it up for us here today on Becoming Multiplanetary. We also have other fantastic shows here on the Total Space Network, including Deep Dive with Miko, The Space Update with Ryan, Space Specials with Adele, and coming soon, STEM Study with Astro Rodi. You can find all these and more here on our YouTube channel, or on Odyssey, or by going to totalspace.net to listen to our episodes in podcast form. And finally, be sure to check out To The Future's YouTube channel for the next and final episode in this Humans in Space mega series collaboration. And once again, you can find all episodes for this mega series in the description. Until next time, I've been Kage, one of your co-hosts for today's episode. And I've been Rich LB, also one of your co-hosts. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you in the next episode of Becoming Multiplanetary.